Councillor Gary Crawford. I am chair of the Budget Committee and clerk has confirmed that we do have quorum and I'd like to call this meeting uh, the afternoon session of the budget uh, to order. I'd like to welcome everyone. Today's meeting is being held with members of the Budget Committee by video conference. Staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. Public continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. I ask for everyone's patience if we experience any delays or technical issues. The members, please uh, remind, remind you to uh, keep your video on uh, while we're listening or hearing the public presentations on the budget. I'd like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and the videos turned off and make it easier for me to uh, follow um, what's happening as long as people who are watching. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are on today is in the traditional territory of many nations, including Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. And we also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none. The purpose of this meeting is of the special meeting of the budget committee is to hear public speakers on the 2022 capital operating budgets. It's the public's opportunity to bring in their aspects or concerns around the budget, uh, positive, negative. It is it's an important part of the process and uh, we're glad that you're all here today. We do have a number of people registered. I think there's about 28 or so, <coughs> 29 um, that we'll be hearing from today. Uh, for the people who are going to be speaking, uh, I think the clerk had mentioned you'll be unmuted um, when your time is um, ready. I will be mentioning three people in advance, just so you know that you're going to be coming up. You'll have up to five minutes to speak to the budget committee. Uh, and there may be questions after that. Um, and you feel free if you want to stick around to listen to the rest of the deputations. But uh, we look forward to speaking with you and hearing from you. Uh, the clerk has also received emails and communications from the public about the 2022 budgets. Um, they're available in CMP, which is the clerk's meeting port portal. Um, and I encourage the public to send in the comments to the budget committee throughout the budget process by emailing buc at toronto.ca. Budget committee, just uh, process wise, um, we'll be meeting this afternoon and this evening to uh, end up or wrap up the uh, public presentation part of the part of the budget process. We'll be meeting on the 28th of January, then again on the February 7th uh, to make final uh, determinations of the budget that we're going to be recommended. That'll go off to full executive and then full council for uh, debate and decision. Any questions from anybody about process wise or anything about this afternoon? Great. Why don't we jump right in? Um, we'll start, I'll read off the first three uh, people who will be speaking to us today. First is Neil Hetherington. Second is Laura Sean Borzovi. And the third is Sam Pritchard. Neil, welcome, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my name is Neil Hetherington. I have the awesome privilege of being the CEO of the Daily Bread Food Bank. An organization which last year saw the highest number of food bank users ever in our history. That number was 1.45 million visits. You as a budget committee are uh, uh, going to be grappling with a number of difficult uh, issues ahead of you and, uh, and I want to commend you for that challenge ahead. I also want to congratulate Council on the concrete steps you have taken in these times around affordable housing, inclusionary zoning, the mental health crisis, and uh, the employment services, transformation projects, among others, all during a pandemic. The city has also had a stellar, been a stellar example in mobilizing a coordinated response to on the ongoing crisis of the pandemic. These are examples of the very concrete ways some of the most vulnerable in the city depend on your actions and decisions. There are also examples of what is possible when we collectively lean into a crisis with empathy and with justice. So together we must respond to the escalating needs that we're seeing and I hope that we can do that together. And there are a multitude of, of ways that we can do that. And I'm going to highlight just three of them right now for your consideration. The first is to continue to embed food access coordination into the city's emergency planning, working with your nonprofit partners so that we are ready to respond. 
This includes material supports, such as continued provision of personal protective equipment, logistical support, and community space that is so needed across the city. The second recommendation to you as a committee, continue to increase investments in tenant protections. Housing security is one of the best ways to ensure people have enough money to feed themselves, yet 80% of the people we serve who live in private market rental buildings are in core housing need. Third recommendation to you as a committee, fully implement the Fair Pass, policy, Fair Pass discount program without further delay. Our research shows that after paying for rent and utilities, most clients attending food banks have less than $10 a day to cover all of their other costs. The $6.40 uh, return fare that they might spend on a transit ride means less food, medicine, and other critical needs. You have heard these same cries for change from me and other deputants year after year, yet these are times are unprecedented. While every household has been affected by COVID-19, your own data shows that low-income and racialized communities have been disproportionately impacted by the ongoing health and economic effects of the pandemic. Our systems and structures do not create the conditions where every Torontonian can thrive. This was a year as residents' needs grew steeply when the Daily Bread expanded. We opened 22 new food, new food programs across the city when normally we would open one or two annually. This, this was done to meet the height of need. We relied on donations from community members and nearly 490,000 volunteer hours, the equivalent of 240 full-time jobs. Toronto residents stepped up for each other at this time of need. While we worked alongside each other, day in and day out of this pandemic, I have heard regularly from people of their deep desire to make sure that we transform the city into a city where every resident can thrive, where we have reduced poverty, uh, where there is no need for a food bank. We are all serving at community members who face the impact of systemic racism and discrimination, the lack of affordable housing, the erosion of permanent secure employment, and wildly insufficient social safety net. So in summary, my call today to you is twofold. We need to sustain our efforts to address the immediate needs of low-income households in the city. And two, we need to build systemic resiliency through structural change in, in an approach grounded in a human rights and, and, and recognition of the dignity that we all should be afforded. I want to thank you, every member of this council, for the time that you have spent uh, in service of every Torontonian. I will be distributing a more detailed uh, summary of this submission for your consideration. And as you review the budget line by line, I would urge you to keep forefront in your mind the 1.45 million client visits to food banks this past year and the power that you have to be able to make change. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Being, oh, Councillor Ainsley. Questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, to the deputy. Uh, Mr. Hetherington, the, the three points that you um, said we need to be looking at in the budget in the first one, sorry, I, I didn't get all of it. You said to embed food access into people's emergency needs? Yeah, uh, into the, <clears throat> th first of all, thank you, Councillor Ansley, for the question. Uh, our call is, is to ensure that in all of the uh, um, uh, city emergency response planning that uh, food access and that coordination of is continued to be embedded. So the city uh, uh, relied, as, as you can imagine, on food banks like Daily Bread, and North York Harvest, uh, and others, um, and, and did a, a phenomenal job in terms of coordination of community space and, uh, and other services. We are hopeful that uh, um, as the city rebuilds and uh, that it will continue to embed food access as a pillar. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Hetherington, your third point about the Fair Pass discount program. How many clients did you serve last year? We served uh, 1.45 million client visits and that would be well over uh, 200,000 individual families. Okay, and you think the re in reinstating or in implementing the Fair Pass discount program would help the vast majority of your clients? 
there is not there isn't a shred of doubt in my mind there were excellent things that happened when, with the uh, layover uh, possibility with the TTC um, that made a huge difference to say a single parent who was coming to a food bank uh, who uh, who was able to get the food that they need and return home um, we're hopeful that that can be fully uh, implemented uh, we know that steps have been taken and we also recognize the tremendous uh, pressures uh, economically that the TTC is on. Okay. And then your second point from your perspective, um, increasing money for tenant protection. When, when you talk about tenant protection, what do you think we need to be looking at? So that would include uh, the city's contributions to uh, to making sure that the uh, tenants have access to the legal resources that they need uh, to be able to uh, um, uh, prevent evictions, um, making sure that the, uh, there is a fully funded uh, rent bank available to uh, to to the tenants across the uh, across the city. Uh, and continue with the efforts that have been already made in terms of employment uh, counseling and uh, and in helping individuals uh, move into a situation where rent is not a barrier. That aside, it's not just the tenant protection. Let me be very clear. It's also the uh, the development of new decent and affordable housing that uh, that is that is critical. So not just the tenant protection. Okay, all right, great. Thank you. Appreciate your time and your deputation today. Uh, Mr. Chair, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no other questions, uh, thank you for your time today, Neil. Next is Lori Sean Borzovoy. Good afternoon, members of the Budget Committee and Chloe. I am Laurie Sean Borzovoy, communication strategist, creative director, writer, and volunteer chair of the Board of Urban Arts. And I'm speaking today on behalf of the six local arts service organizations or LASSOs of Toronto, Arts Etobicoke, East End Arts, Lakeshore Arts, North York Arts, Scarborough Arts, and Urban Arts. Thank you for acknowledging the importance of arts and culture with the enhancement of the 1.83 million to the economic development and culture division in the 2022 budget. While we are pleased to see this increase in funding committed to the city, the lassos that serve hard hit and underserved communities outside the downtown core will not see an increase in 2022. I will now outline how the lasso serve communities outside the downtown core, our impact and the commitments and actions we would like to see from the city in the years ahead. The lassos have a shared mission to provide free, accessible and quality programming to the communities we serve every day. For the lassos, this means building, delivering and supporting programming that addresses immediate community needs from food and art supply delivery to online programs addressing social isolation for youth, seniors and adults, social justice, food security, and mental health. And we continue adapting our community arts programs and services based on identified and present needs. The six lassos continue to support the rebuilding and recovery efforts outlined in the Toronto Office Recovery and Rebuild Report and the 2021 Toronto Vital Signs Report and many strategic priorities of the city, including cultivating strategic community business and arts based partnerships, serving key equity deserving neighborhoods outside the downtown core where arts and cultural funding is not being invested to the degree that is within the downtown core and increased support and opportunities for artists and cultural sector workers and directly addressing precarious employment in the sector. And as noted in the 2021 Vital Signs Report, a November 2020 survey of more than 1,200 artists stated that 12% were no longer able to be working in the sector. The lassos continued to exceed all investment by the city. In 2021, the lassos received 1.8 million from the City of Toronto and collectively generated an additional 2.5 million for a gross revenue totaling more than 4.3 million. The lasso serve 83% of the population of Toronto, or a total of 2.7 million people, and 80% of all Toronto wards, while municipal funding remains concentrated on the 17% in the downtown core. This means that five downtown wards receive double the TAC funding than the other 20 wards combined. And the TAC 2020 stats indicate that the per capita amount of funded artists and projects across the city is far from equitable. In 2020, per capita population investment in Toronto's downtown wards was $15.61, while investment outside the downtown core was only $2.49. 
The TAC also cites issues in pay equity for artists, noting that downtown artists are paid on a per capita basis 285% more than artists residing outside the downtown core. So what three things do the lassos ask? Number one, a commitment to increased investment to, a lasso, to the lasso portfolio in the years ahead, beginning in 2023, to support communities outside the downtown core and then to address the inequities noted, including a commitment to see shuffling funds within the portfolio in order to achieve the service equity, a commitment to achieving equity through increase to the lassos to bring service levels in the east and north up to meet population and community demand without penalizing other lassos, and a commitment to bring the per capita investment in communities outside the downtown core in line with that within the downtown core. A commit, number two, a commitment to working with the lassos to develop a new and responsive community cultural review, which includes specific targets for funding, art space, and equity sufficient to propel communities outside Toronto's downtown core through the next decade. And number three, a commitment to deliver on the 2021 Vital Signs Report recommendations for the funders in the arts, culture, and recreation sectors. We all look forward to seeing the city's roadmap for increased investment in the Lasso portfolio and working together to achieve these commitments for community arts in Toronto. We trust that our combined efforts will enhance the arts and cultural landscape in Toronto for generations to come. Thank you all on behalf of all the Lassos. Thank, Thank you very much, Laurie. <clears throat> Any questions? Count, uh, we'll start with Councillor Nunziata and Councillor Lai. Yeah, uh, thank you for your deputation. Now, have you spoken to staff about, um, I know there was a report that came through that Councillor Holiday actually put through at Community Council on the uh, lassos from outside uh, downtown. Um, have you had any dialogue at all with staff um, on the inequity? Uh, yes, we have. In fact, thank you for the question, Councillor Nunziata. And yes, we have. We have been having some meetings. Uh, the EDs and chairs who are invited have had a call similar to this where we have been conversing and we are looking forward to uh, working together and have said that we, we all were in agreement that we would be doing that going forward. Yes. Okay. So, but uh, what, has there been any commitments from staff at all uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, putting forward a fair process throughout the city? Uh, no, the commitment so far was that we would develop that plan, that we would work together to develop that plan. But um, I'm unaware of any movement forward since that last meeting that we had with staff. Uh, and I will uh, defer to my partners at the Lassos because I do represent such a large group. <laughs> to um, deliver any further information regarding that to you uh, immediately hereafter. But uh, to, to, as far as I am concerned, I have not seen or heard any further conversations or a resolution as to what those plans would be to achieve that. Because there's definitely a non-fairness there, correct? Um, which Significant. we've been trying to communicate for years now. I would say that we gained acknowledgement of that unfairness and a commitment on behalf of staff to work with us to try and remedy the situation and, and to participate in uh, uh, those plans, um, which it was uh, for us that was a great first step, but we are still waiting on seeing the rubber hit the road, as we say. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for Councillor Nunziata. Thank you, Councillor Lai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your deputation, and I'm just uh, on the same vein as uh, <coughs> Councillor Nunziata. As a first term councillor, I, I, I don't, I mean, some of these things I'm not very clear. Uh, so you do not get, how does the six lassos uh, get their funding? Through different sources, or you don't get it from TAC, do you? Uh, we get our uh, mostly culture services. Um, and uh, but also other sources, other levels of government, other private fu funders, fundraising, uh, perhaps memberships, um, that sort of thing. Uh, definitely, that's where the the differences between the 1.8 from the city of Toronto and the 2.5 of gross revenue comes from those other sources. So basically, the 1.8 million is from the uh, from this from the Toronto is from the economic development uh, funding for the cultural 
the cultural uh, aspect of, of that. Is that correct? Uh, I believe the lion's share of that, if not all, but I would again defer to my uh, partners to give you the specific details on that uh, right after this meeting. They will deliver that to you. And you're saying that the 2.5 million gross uh, revenue that you, you've you raised, is it from different sources or from, from fundraising? Am I correct? It would be different levels of government for various types of programming, as well as fundraising uh, out in the public, um, corporate uh, donations, and um, perhaps memberships or participation in programs. Some of the programs are fee-based and most are actually free, but um, uh, there would also be a source there of revenue. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I actually represent Scarborough and I really want to thank Scarborough Arts Council to actually, uh, you know, reach out to my ward. I mean, imagine North of 401, I'm the only ward there, and they, are, they have included us in some of these art uh, events, which is making it awareness very, very good. I think it's very important that you, you be made aware that uh, lassos exist. And I think uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree with, with uh, Councillor Nunziata more that it's not happening fast enough, but uh, I mean, we, we can commit to, uh, to move this forward and 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 fill the uh, equity gap. Okay, thank you for your uh, well, dedication. Councilor Lai, Councilor Lai, thank you so much for your comments. And yes, we are hoping this is very much our point is we are hoping that council will see fit to uh, move the city staff forward on our behalf and make the changes required, help us to achieve our plans and gain some equity for the arts and culture and support of the communities outside the downtown core. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Chair, you. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Um, just to be, uh, I just want to 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 be clear. What you're looking for is equity, and, and we but we do all agree that equity equity is not necessarily the same as equal. Um, uh, I'm thinking back to the the exhaustive evaluation that was done of lassos and and bringing on the new lassos and making sure that. They got a leg up in funding to get them going, but but the the funding is actually allotted on the basis of uh, the number of programs that are being offered, the number of of service organizations and artists that are actually a part of each collective. So what you're looking for is equity based on what the offering and capacity is of each of the lassos. But but as long as it's equitable, meaning that uh, that that there's there's fair acknowledgement and and room to grow for each that that's that's basically what you're advocating right yes very much and the per capita figures uh, assist us there because we assume that there should be equity between citizens regardless of where you live you should have access to community arts and when we see the the disparate uh, amounts of funding put forward based on a location within the city, uh, it's very difficult for the um, outlying regions to provide that support and service to their constituents. Right. And, so but there's also the equity start to come into it, but it, it's not the only factor. You're not you're not That's advocating it. that that be the only factor. No, not not right. by okay. any means. As well as the, there's also the equity between the lassos that we are also concerned we see happen appropriately as you have uh, shown. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you very much, Lori, for coming out. Thank you. Next is uh, Sammy Pritchard. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. My name is Sammy Pritchard, and I am the manager of advocacy at YWCA Toronto, which is the city's largest multi-service organization serving women, girls, and gender diverse people. The more than 13,000 people we serve across the city depend on our services to escape gender-based violence, access safe and affordable housing and emergency shelter, and secure employment. Many of our programs are funded by the city, a partnership for which we are grateful. We are heartened by commitments such as the Housing TO Action Plan, the creation of a gender equity office, the development of a non-police crisis team, and the embedding of an equity lens in the budget. And we commend the city for the re recent implementation of a $4 wage top-up to emergency shelter workers, recognizing the risks that these workers are taking day in and day out to serve our community. However, our community members are facing multiple challenges that are not fully addressed by the proposed 2022 budget. We are glad not to see any cuts, but we know that maintaining service levels with piecemeal enhancements 
does not go far enough to address the systemic inequities on racial, gender, and neighborhood lines growing in our city. Inequities that have only been heightened by the pandemic for our community members. While at last there's been a property tax increase, no other new revenue tools have been introduced to address the mounting crises faced by essential services. As nonprofit operators, many of us are providing essential services at cost, having to fundraise to fill in gaps in government funding. For multiple years, we've implored the city to consider new revenue tools. Nearly 50% of the city shelters are managing outbreaks in an already precarious system. The 11.6 million in additional SSHA funding does not seem enough to meet the dire need, nor does the 12 million in funding for a 10 year community safety and well being plan, especially when contrasted with a police budget of $1 billion every year. We do not feel the concerns of our program participants, those facing food insecurity, struggling to pay rent, dealing with increased violence and precarity at home and at work, and mounting caregiving responsibilities are fully reflected in the priorities of this budget. Yes, investments have been made, but do they go far enough and deep enough to address the realities on the ground? For example, Many of our frontline staff, such as cleaners, cooks, childcare, and shelter workers, rely on public transit to get to and from work. But these workers are not eligible for a TTC discount because funding for phase three of the Fair Pass discount program seems to be absent from the budget. We know the city has working poor who would benefit from affordable or even free transit to get to essential services. We expect these people to clean our shelters and work during a pandemic that has exposed them to so much risk, but cannot seem to find an affordable way for them to get to work. This feels wrong. We have more women in our affordable housing programs who are struggling to pay rent than ever before. We are concerned that the level of funding for rent relief initiatives in the budget does not match the level of growing need across the city. We fear that more women will lose their housing and their children and will have their safety compromised because the city did not intervene in a critical moment of the pandemic to address growing needs. Funding for a housing commissioner is still missing from the budget. The actions taken with this budget will have long-term ramifications. Many strategies, offices, and novel solutions have been explored, but the budget allocations for most of these programs seem to fall short of the type of investment needed to make impact and scale up solutions. We understand the city is facing many fiscal pressures, but we are worried that this proposed budget has taken an old approach to new and growing problems. As you reflect on all of the deputations over these two days, we do hope you will seriously consider enhanced funding measures, new revenue tools for future years, and creatively support improved access to services in full and equal partnership with community agencies. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. The next three speakers will be Christina Markham, Caitlin Cabral, and Brenda Harris. Christina, welcome. Can you hear us, Christina? Hi, yes, I apologize. I was just having a bit of a technical difficulty. Do you hear me okay? We hear you great, all yours, go ahead. Beautiful, thank you. Um, good afternoon, counselors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm a resident of Parkdale High Park, and on Tuesday of last week, I attended my first budget town hall led by Councillor Gord Perks. I was saddened but not surprised to hear that in this latest budget, we are not making the investments necessary to replace the city's aging bus fleet and ignoring the climate goals we set just last month. As a lifelong Toronto resident, I have watched the city become gradually less and less livable. And it feels like that decline has been rapidly accelerating over the last decade. The same can be said, obviously, for our planet. The decisions we make for our city don't just impact the residents of Toronto. As the biggest city in Canada and the fourth largest city in North America, we have not only an opportunity, but a responsibility to lead by example. Shirking our responsibilities gives other municipalities the license to do the same. But by setting bold targets and holding ourselves accountable, we can demonstrate to the world what's possible. This is not a change we can put off till tomorrow or to, or to the next budget. Every day, the impact of climate change becomes more and more apparent and our window to intervene gets smaller. 
To quote David Suzuki, we're all in a car headed towards a brick wall. We can't be wasting time debating where we all sit. I'm speaking today to implore the councillors to fight to make meeting our, our environmental targets among the city's highest priorities. The issues facing our city are no doubt complex, from affordable housing, access to food, to racial justice. But our accomplishments as a city will mean nothing if our city and our planet are inhospitable to human life. Thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for your service to our city. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next speaker. Caitlin uh, Cabral or Cabral. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Cabral. I'm a registered nurse and I care deeply about the health and the well being of individuals experiencing homelessness who face many barriers in getting appropriate health care. Currently, I'm working as the Infection Prevention and Control Resource Lead with the Toronto Drop-In Network. I have come to see just how vital drop-in spaces are to the mental, physical, and spiritual well-being of those experiencing homelessness. Drop-ins are spaces where individuals can go, for example, to obtain a healthy meal, visit with a nurse or doctor, take a shower, access internet, and have respite from the extreme heat or cold. Drop-ins also serve as spaces where individuals can build relationships and participate in community. The COVID-19 pandemic has also highlighted the importance of the health and safety of drop-in workers who maintain these critical services. I am asking that the city increase the budget of city-funded drop-ins by $500,000 to help keep sites running so that those who are homeless or are precariously housed have a safe place to go to obtain basic necessities for life and well-being. While we acknowledge and are extremely grateful that the city has previously given drop-ins increased funding throughout the pandemic, there is still so much need within the sector that continues and will continue even beyond the pandemic. Over the last two years, drop-ins have seen a dramatic increase in the number of participants they see each week, with many sites serving hundreds of meals per day. Drop-ins have had to adapt their space and services many times to be able to offer them safely, but there is only so much that drop-ins can do when they don't have enough staff due to critical staffing shortages, don't have enough PPE, proper ventilation, or even enough takeaway containers to serve meals in. These are just a few of the problems that our sites run into, which have caused many to not be able to open their indoor space or sometimes even operate at all. For many individuals across the city, this may mean that they go without a meal, without bathroom access, or warm space for days at a time. According to the 2021 Streets Needs Assessment, there are over 7,000 people who are homeless on any given night within the City of Toronto. Those experiencing homelessness are at an increased risk of experiencing severe illness and even death associated with pathogens and diseases, even outside of the COVID-19 pandemic. Increased funding to drop-ins could go towards improving indoor air quality, helping not only to prevent COVID-19 transmission, but also to prevent additional illnesses, such as tuberculosis and influenza. Additionally, drop-ins serve as a safe and trusted space where individuals can access key health services. Increased funding to these services would lessen the burden on the already immensely, immensely strained healthcare system in Ontario. Funding could also help drop-in spaces with uh, to provide access to computers and phone charging stations to help people stay connected with friends, family, essential health care appointments, and employment opportunities. Our staff and participants have suffered greatly due to the lack of resources, and it is only getting worse. So I urge the city to please increase funding of these essential drop-in spaces to support them in safely caring for the physical and mental health needs of some of our most vulnerable citizens. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Caitlin. Appreciate you being here today. Seeing no questions, next we'll go on to Brenda Paris. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. My name is Brenda Paris. I'm a resident of Toronto in the District of St. Paul's. Thank you very much for an opportunity to speak today. I'm the parent of an adult son with a developmental disability as well as a physical disability requiring the use of a wheelchair and accessible housing. 
I was asked by fellow parents to speak to the budget committee this week regarding the inclusion of our family needs and the needs of people with developmental disabilities. The needs of folks with developmental disability are often not considered, nor are they usually addressed in any operational policy or in policy decisions or capital budget considerations. Other groups are incorporated often into these discussions of budget and policy, but the concerns and the different needs of our family members are often not addressed. Um, there's different reasons for this. I won't go into the long discussion and history of deinstitutionalization, but I think part of it is the, um, the out of sight, out of mind aspect of this. Um, when people were deinstitutionalized, they were basically dumped on families and communities with no additional supports and were reaping the consequences of no particular budget line attached to this, this group, um, no particular budget line for housing. Um, there's no specific housing program available through the province, so often people are falling off the, off the cliff. We're often not as vocal as other groups, and I speak to you today to consider us in these targets, goals, and directives that you'll be considering. Uh, someone mentioned an equity lens earlier, and I would suggest the equity lens should include developmental disability. Thus, I'd like to recommend a few recomm uh, suggestions here to the Budget Committee. Generally speaking, the specific needs of the disabled, dis developmentally disabled sector should be included in any operational budgets or future capital planning. Specifically, with respect to capital planning, I'd like to recommend that specific numbers and or percentages in the housing budget be targeted to this demographic. This includes any partnerships with the private sector, not-for-profit sector, and the broader public sector. Without targets, there is no accountability. And often we've experienced this where they say oh, we're being considered, but we don't see anything in results. The principle should be that housing constructed with public funds should include these targets. And in addition to that, full wheelchair accessibility. Uh, I ran into this problem for my son where we were in a building that did receive funding from different levels of government and the washroom was not fully accessible and the property management refused to uh, renovate and adapt. It was only when I obtained a lawyer at my private expense um, threatening human rights code violation that it was done. And this is something that is occurring as we speak. Secondly, rent subsidies uh, should be attached to the individual so it goes with them wherever they choose to live. This will all expand the range of options and uh, not restrict the choice of where and how they obtain housing. Um, rent subsidies can be used as a useful tool in this respect if they are able to find housing that meets their needs, that the assistance of rent subsidy would help. And further to that point, I had been directed by my parents that the Canadian housing benefit apparently currently does not apply to people in receipt of ODSP, the Ontario Disability Supports Program. Uh, this supplement would go a long way to address the issue of choice and expand the options available. And I, I want to stress this point about choice, that people you know, need a choice and, and um, option of what sort of housing they want to live in. Thirdly, the unique needs of people with development disability are not the same as other groups requiring housing. We must ensure they are not just simply add and stir. Okay. Our, the needs are different primarily because of this issue of social vulnerability okay and the naivete that often comes with the cognitive deficits uh, i myself had to move my son out of a housing project for this very reason because he was targeted by drug dealers and um, police would do nothing property management would do nothing the supportive housing provider uh, adopts the harm reduction philosophy that does not intervene in these situations so I ask that you engage and consult with the community, including parent and advocacy groups, in addition to the agency representatives that you might be more familiar with. And finally, no discussion of housing can be removed from the need for personal and social supports. Um, there are increasingly becoming more available the provincial funding for this. Um, I would say basically we need to adopt a housing first policy. If you build it, they will come and increasingly various uh, support programs are being developed. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Crawford. Um, to Brenda Paris, Brenda, could you explain a bit uh, or elaborate a bit about, you said the Canadian housing supplement can't be used by people on ODSP. Can um, you explain that a bit and the relevance of it? I'm not personally familiar with that. I was asked to include that in my presentation, but I imagine it would be uh, people in receipt of social assistance are not deemed eligible. That often happens with a number of programs. Councillor Carroll, I noticed you had your acknowledgement and hand up at that point. Is there something you can provide? Well, I, I was going to go next to ask you questions, okay. but uh, uh, that is true. And, and uh, uh, I'd be uh, happy to go over it with Councillor Ainsley. Okay. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get to, I'll get to it further in my questions. Okay. And where it has a consequence is that if you're not eligible for it, then you can't then use it as a form of rent supplement to, to um, reduce the, the rental load that you may have. So obviously okay. if you're not eligible for a program that could be a good solution. That obviously has consequences. Thanks, Brenda, and thanks for your presentation this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, I I'm wondering if uh, if you're aware that uh, uh, that 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 issue of not being able to use it for housing that's unique to our province. Yes, our province is it's a Canadian benefit, but our province has made a choice locally. Not okay. to make it uh, 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 usable by people on our provincial ODSP program. Okay. Uh, you move to Nova Scotia, you can suddenly use it for that very purpose, or or Saskatchewan or British Columbia. Yes. Okay. Um, so it it is something that that the city should be advocating for. I'm wondering if um, uh, we we should be getting in in uh, touch with your parent group. Uh, it strikes me that the thing that's really uh, left missing here, what, what's a struggle, is often when the parents of, of, uh, of uh, you know, the, their adult children living right. with disability come forward, I'm, I'm one of them, uh, so is the chair, uh, but uh, uh, my daughter lives with us. When you come forward to advocate for them, you get a lot of people saying, yeah, that's terrible, thank goodness that that person has you. Yes, um, yes. And what's yes. left is if we if we don't, get these benefits ingrained. What happens is uh, the day mom and dad move into long-term care right. or pass That's away, right. That's right. they are a very expensive crisis for us. Yes, they are. And suddenly we have to deal with everything all at once. Yes. And 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 that's that's the that that's where this is costing us when we get to the end of the road by not situating them while while you're still able to supervise their their uh, their care plan well two points there one is we tend to privatize the pain you know out of sight out of mind and with the yeah. deinstitutionalization you know all the responsibility was dumped on the families uh, this is becoming in high relief as well with the ever expanding numbers of folks on the autistic spectrum because that's the new gang in town so to speak that is deemed to be on the developmental and a growing gang. Well. Yeah, and a growing, right. Secondly, I think it's important to have universal policies that apply to all. You know, so generalized programs, universal programs uh, would help if they are universally applied, right? So uh, if we had a, a good base of um, housing options, co-op housing, public housing, private housing, if we had a good base there with some requirements of representation and accessibility, then that would go a long way to helping individuals and families make choices uh, at the appropriate time for themselves. And as you say, uh, the longer you, you wait, the, the worse. And we're now seeing sizable numbers of people entering the long-term care system, which is somewhat in denial about the province, but I'm hearing to various parent groups that the numbers are growing. So as, as parents get old, disabled, or die, which is the great one, um, that these folks are going into long-term care, which of course age-wise is not appropriate. Which is quite costly for us. because Absolutely. Often, it's hours that they end up in. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other one and the, the, the last one I would ask about is the, the issue of um, uh, while, while these folks are on, on ODSP, a lot of times what's happening is we're, we're sort of wedding that program to we'll help that program along with the other programs that that also need supports. And so what we're doing is we keep sort of throwing them together with yes. 
with uh, perhaps yeah, nice. the drug using public. They, it sort yeah. of normalizes it for them. And then when we situate them in housing, yeah. they are very vulnerable. You yes, described a scenario in which uh, which uh, your son was was really targeted. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, we kind of built the situation in which that could happen. Absolutely. Um, are the the parenting uh, the parents that you're you're uh, working with are they sort of an organized group that 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 the city could begin to consult with uh, on a, a more active basis? There are, and there's increasingly more and more forming because in the absence of any particular government housing response, parents are trying to come together. I'm fortunate compared to most in that I do have housing for my son obtained through various ways that I won't go into the detail here, but I'm a huge and strong advocate, which not every parent is. So you can't just depend on parents being sophisticated Philadelphia lawyers to know how to get benefits and services for their adult children. Exactly. So I think, yes, there are people we, we certainly be happy to talk to you. And, and, and it's a sensitive issue because I don't want to stigmatize other groups that are coming to the table, but I want people to understand you can't just add and stir Mixing yeah. client groups does not work. Generally speaking, that's a principle in social services, but increasingly it will have to be understood. And supportive housing models uh, that apply to the mental health community do not work in the way, same way for our community. So you can't just mix and stir, slice and dice. Um, and it all the while trying to understand the uniqueness. Uh, there's a saying that every person with a disability is a unique person with a disability. You can't generalize. But there are some general principles you can adhere to. Thank you. Right, uh, I'd be I'd be happy uh, uh, for the group to get in touch with my office. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next three speakers: Brad Dixon, Doug Pritchard, and Abigail Doris. So, Brad Dixon, you're up. Thank you. Um, my name's we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, good. My name is Brad Dixon. I'm a resident of Toronto. Here's just points I have. I'd like to eliminate the bonus for city managers as in the pay performance. It equals $10 million per year annually. Uh, this actually equates to a community centre being built in Toronto every four years. Now, salary pay and benefits should be incentive for the performance. Managers are not union, only an association, and the city has the right to stop this program completely. With regards to affordable rent, small landlords provide an affordable alternative to corporate landlords, thus providing more units on the market. Small landlords have been driven out of the rental market due to policies that make it financially unaffordable. Some small landlords are not corporations, and as such, the city should make provisions such as lower property taxes charged if they rent below market value and provide faster access to eviction for non-payment or at least access to city-sponsored small landlord legal services as those provided by to renters. Now, housing is affordable. If houses were unaffordable, no one would be buying them, and yet they are being sold. So houses are affordable, yet no one looks at who is actually buying them, which is needed. Canadians pay more in taxes than they do in housing costs. Therefore, until governments release their hold on the buying power of incomes, citizens will be hampered in their ability to buy. Affordable housing programs are a windfall for developers, some residents, employers, and politicians. Developers get amendments to the zoning amendments that go on per perpetuity. Some residents who qualify receive the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax-free dollars. Employers get a workforce who limit salary requests not to jeopardize the level needed for the affordable housing. Politicians win as they get electorates who will be loyal to any politician who wants to maintain the housing program and will get voted in again. I suggest sell off city owned housing to individuals who will become small landlords, maintain, et cetera, and get monthly uh, rent from that. No large co corporations should be able to buy those properties. I also say we have seen reduced services and reduced services should mean reduced taxes. We have had service reductions for a few years. Politicians give excuses, but we don't see a drop in taxes that fund these services in all departments. For example, Moving services online should mean that departments get a reduced budget. We've also seen ultimatums for some, but not for all. The city has no issues of recently presenting drastic ultimatums to those who work and contribute financially to the city, such as telling city employees they either work at homeless shelters or get laid off and shift the cost of the federal government to the CERB program, thus taking them off the city books. 
Employees also face the ultimatum of job loss should they oppose certain city policies. The city also gives ultimatum to businesses who want to retain their livelihood and remain open to pay employees and their taxes and get income. If those businesses don't comply, not only do police enforce compliance to the city, but the city sends the business owner the bill for the police action taken. Yet no ultimatum is given to those who are supplied with four-star hotel accommodations along with three meals a day, even if they destroy the property, the city covers all costs. No talk of shifting the cost to those who fall under federal or provincial jurisdictions, nor does anyone with drug abuse have to adhere to a drug rehab program or be part of the skills training program or even be actively looking for employment. If they don't adhere to these programs, they should lose their accommodation along with three meals a day. As I said, the city gives ultimatum to city staff and businesses that will result in loss of their accommodation and their ability to fund their, their food. Programs claimed to reduce gang violence should be tied to gang violence rates. Many programs claim to reduce violent crime with analogies that are antidotal at best. So their funding should be tied directly to any violent crime reduction numbers that are pr proved to be directly related to their efforts and not antidotal analogies. Programs are great to have, and as a matter of fact, they should be justified just on what they provide in realistic terms. We also need to encourage a facility economy that will grow small businesses rather than taxing it. The city, for example, provides tax credits to encourage film productions in Toronto, and a similar tax credit would be great for small businesses. So you buy from uh, Toronto businesses, buy from small businesses, they would receive a business tax credit. I also suggest to eliminate year-end spending sprees, allow departments the ability to carry over savings. Departments in the city have to spend their budget before fiscal year end to maintain their budget level for the next year. This should be eliminated and allow departments to go carry over savings. The other note too is, is that when you say, well, we could have raised taxes 5%, but we only raised them 2%, so we save 3%. That's, to wrap up, please. Okay, that's, that's still an increase to taxpayers of 2%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brad. Next speaker will be Doug Pritchard. Welcome, Doug. Good afternoon, Good afternoon councillors, and I appreciate this opportunity to uh, to speak with you this, this afternoon. Um, I'm a retired chemical engineer, and I've lived in Ward uh, 19 for the past 33 years. Um, and I've worked uh, for many years in the fossil fuel sector, uh, both in Alberta and Australia and Toronto. And, and at that time, I didn't know about the impact of greenhouse gases uh, from the work that I was doing. Uh, but as I was retiring, my kids started handing me articles about climate change and saying, Dad, you got to read this. You got to get informed. You got to get involved. And so I did. And, and now I know uh, about the impact. And so I'm really glad that the city of Toronto has also recognized this climate emergency uh, and has set ambitious targets, including the recent target of uh, being net zero by 2040. But now we need action. Buildings account for 57% of Toronto's emissions. So I've done what I can with my 100-year-old house, uh, semi-detached house in Toronto. So with some modest investments um, and with some changes in behavior and turning down the thermostats and so on, uh, I've been able to reduce my use of natural gas and electricity by 50% over the last 10 years. So the city needs to do likewise, other residents and city buildings and industries as well. We need city programs to reduce emissions from new buildings uh, and from existing buildings. Um, but in order to do that, we need a fully staffed department to assist residents uh, in, in making the changes that they need to make. I understand the Department of uh, Environment and Energy, there are about 100 staff positions in the budget, but only 60 of them are currently filled. So some of that may be due to uh, the, the pandemic, uh, but it also leaves us really hampered in trying to assist residents in making changes to their own uh, living environments to reduce their, their emissions. Um, and so they, they need both the staffing uh, to assist residents and they need the funds to support grant programs and other incentives. Uh, that's the biggest sector that we can address as a city. And the next biggest sector is transport. It accounts for 36% of Toronto's emissions. So I'm a keen cyclist and I use my bike every day, summer and winter. Although the past week, uh, the bike lanes haven't made that possible. I do it for shopping, I do it for work, I do it for recreation. In fact, for my, in my 65th year, uh, I bicycled across Canada from Vancouver to Halifax. 
So I'm a serious cyclist. And I was really pleased uh, that one of the good outcomes of the COVID crisis has been an increase in protected bike lanes in the city. I use those bike lanes to take my grandchildren uh, to and from my house uh, every week. Uh, and, and so I'm really pleased to see the city make that investment and, and their plans to do it for the long term. Um, but another outcome of the, of the pandemic has been on the TTC ridership, which has dropped precipitously. Uh, and if we're going to reduce the city's emissions from transport, uh, we need to invest much more capital in the TCT, TTC than this budget currently uh, is including. Uh, now that may look a bit strange, while ridership is low uh, during the pandemic, some subways and some buses are going past uh, virtually empty, but we need to be investing now and we need to be investing every year because this pandemic is not going to last forever and the ridership will come back and we need more riders if we're going to reduce our emissions in the transport sector. So the city needs to be investing now and every year for a greatly expanded carbon-free TTC. Uh, and we need more than incentives. Uh, the grants and the carrots uh, are good ways to promote climate actions, but we also need some, some disincentives and some sticks to discourage the use of fossil fuels. So if road tolls are still an anathema for the province uh, and, and for some in the city, then let's at least bring back a significant registration tax on fossil fuel vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles make up uh, a remarkable 65% of all new car sales in Norway. And that's been achieved largely by taxing fossil fuel uh, engines uh, much more heavily than electric vehicles. And we're also going to need a decent network of charging stations across the city. I'm fortunate that I have a driveway so I can plug in my hybrid car, uh, but many city residents aren't able to do that. And we need a greatly expanded uh, network of on-street city chargers. And this will generate both revenue and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So in conclusion, Toronto has some ambitious climate targets and I applaud you for, for those, but now we need action. And this budget is going to reveal our true priorities. Will it be hot air or less carbon? Thanks. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, uh, next three speakers are Abigail Doris, Emily Diron, and Madison Hammond. Abigail Doris. Hello, are you able to hear me? I can hear you great. Go ahead, Abigail. Oh, perfect. Thanks so much. Hi, my name is Abigail Doris. I'm a registered early childhood educator and the coordinator for the Toronto Community for Better Child Care. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to thank Toronto Children's Services City staff and the Budget Committee for recognizing the need to increase the city's child care budget. Toronto's service manager has done an exceptional job in leading the child care community throughout the pandemic and for that we're very grateful. Yesterday, you may have heard that none of it signed their child care deal with the federal government. And this, of course, leaves Ontario standing alone without a federal child care deal signed. This directly impacts Toronto families. As you know, we pay the highest child care fees in all of Canada, equivalent to carrying a second rent or mortgage each month. And I'm hearing from local nonprofit child care centers that many are having to raise their fees an additional three to five percent this year. And it appears the city has only put a 1% infl um, inflation factor into purchase of service agreements, but has increased the budgets for municipally operated centers. Is there a way for the city to increase funds for purchase of service holders to help centers freeze their fees and ideally to reduce their fees? I think we all agree that Toronto families shouldn't be paying the price of the provinces in action to get the federal agreement signed. Also, is it possible for the city to provide short-term sustainability funding or permit some flexibility in the use of existing funds for centers between now and whenever the federal deal is signed? As you've heard from nonprofit childcare operators earlier today and yesterday, the Ministry of Education recently removed critical tools, including reporting and access to PCR testing that childcare centers have used to mitigate the transmission of COVID in our programs. And this policy change has led to ongoing room and program closures that fluctuate from week to week, sometimes from day to day, hour to hour even. Centers were also impacted by the mandated school closures and thus revenue so far this year has been inconsistent and often fall short of covering operational and staffing costs. Can the city continue to flow per diems 
as centers navigate these unpredictable ongoing closures? And can the city provide some flexibility with how centers use their per diems in order to remain operational and fully staffed as we are currently facing a significant staffing crisis sector wide? Is it possible for the city to fill the funding gaps centers are experiencing from low enrollment and lost revenue? The federal funding programs like the wage subsidies that were used last year to fill these gaps are no longer available. And I understand and fully appreciate what Councilor Carroll had mentioned in this morning's session that this year's childcare budget will have to be revised when and if the province signs the deal. With that, we are losing our families and our highly feminized and racialized workforce at an alarming rate. And I worry that our very fragile childcare system won't make it to that deal without support and funding guidance from the city. Anything that the city can do, especially getting at that negotiation table as Toronto is the largest childcare service manager across Canada outside of Quebec with expertise that is greatly lacking at the provincial level. Anything that the city can do to financially sustain childcare programs right now is deeply appreciated by Toronto's families and the childcare workforce. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your leadership on this. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll go on to the next speaker, Emily Deeroy. I think that's how I pronounce your last name, but you can correct me if I erred. Hi, yeah, uh, Emily Derwin. Um, okay. Hi, thank you for hearing me speak today. Uh, during the last few years of my teens, I relied on social services as a means of survival. Um, now I'm doing my student placement at the Toronto Drop-In Network. Uh, this is a place I never thought I would get to. I never th even thought I would graduate high school. So having the privilege of seeking higher education and being involved in a network that supports drop-in spaces uh, to people who need them is a dream. Um, but during my teens, I relied on spaces like drop-ins for safety, warmth, and community. Uh, I truly believe that having spaces available like drop-ins is crucial to fostering caring relationships with our communities. I relied on access to menstrual products within the agencies I was supported by like drop-ins. Unfortunately, even accessing these products within agencies was hard as they often relied on the inconsistent donation of menstrual products. This meant that there were times I had no choice but to go without. Through the budget item uh, to fund menstrual products and incontinence products within spa spaces of respite, we have the opportunity to alleviate some of the inequities Torontonians face by providing these products within these spaces. As a wealthy city with the funds to make this happen, I want to urge you to think of your loved ones who may use these products. If they were somehow unavailable or inaccessible, the profound impact that would have on their daily life and functioning. I had to experience life without these necessary products. On top of that, I had to experience people's perception of my humanity when I went without these products. I hope we as a city can see how incredibly crucial, necessary, and needed this funding would be. As a 17-year-old, I was constantly having to battle to be treated with dignity and respect. It was made 100 times harder when I was without necessary products like menstrual pads or tampons. These were things that were lumped in with the numerous other essential items I could ill afford at the time. The funding of these products within drop-ins would have been life-changing for me. I hope to live to see the day where this is widely accessible in all public spaces so that no one has to go through the inequities I did in my teens. I hope to see this past as I want to believe that City Council values human rights and upholding community members' dignity, especially during such uncertain times for many. We all know people who benefit from having the ability to afford these menstrual products and incontinence products but I want you to know how significant access to these sanitary products uh, is, because to go without them means you are barred from society and seen as less than. I hope to see this budget item passed as it will have profound impacts on folks' quality of life. Drop-in spaces are essential and should be funded as such. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Madison Hammond. Welcome, Madison. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Madison Hammond. I'm a social service work student at George Brown College and currently completing a placement with Toronto Drop-In Network. But more importantly, I am somebody who has lived experience with using social service programs like drop-in centers. 
As a person who knows firsthand what it is like to be deprived of basic human rights, I can tell you that the lack of support this council provides to our unhoused neighbors is frankly disgusting. The city needs to provide vital services like drop-in centers with more funding so that we can better support people who are experiencing homelessness in our city. I struggle to understand why in one of the richest cities in the world, people are living without adequate housing in the first place. I also struggle to understand why this council continuously gives completely unnecessary funding to Toronto Police Services. There are people dying because they do not have access to the most basic human rights. I recently started attending the Toronto Homeless Memorial every month, and the amount of loss that our unhoused community has faced is unimaginable. So when you all go to sleep tonight in a warm house, I urge you to seriously consider who this 2022 budget benefits. While I could go on about why it is vital to provide more funding to services like drop-in centers and to create real affordable housing, and to do something about the profound loss that our community has faced this year, I come to you today with a very small ask. Drop-in centers rely on inconsistent donations of menstrual and incontinence products, and because of this, our city's drop-ins are faced with the impossible decision of deciding who does and doesn't deserve to have access to these items. To be in a situation where you need a tampon pad or adult diaper, and to be told that you can't have one is utterly humi humiliating. It is unjust and it is dehumanizing. It takes a huge toll on a person's mental health and well-being, and it puts people who often already live with health complications at risk of things like infection. Having a budget that is specifically allocated to buying these hygiene products needs to become a priority. After a year of such profound loss in our unhoused community, I sincerely hope that this council takes this small act and brings back some form of dignity to people who are experiencing homelessness. I urge you to stop denying people of their basic human rights. With that, I thank you for taking the time to hear me speak today. Thank you very much for coming out. Next three speakers are Ilya Kranin, Max Moore, and Brian McLean. Ilya? Are you with us? Ilya Kranin? Yes. Oh, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Sweet. Hello, everybody. I'm here speaking on behalf of the Reach Out Response Network, which is a local nonprofit that works on finding alternatives to policing of the community-oriented kind. Uh, I want to keep my speech brief, but to the point, I would like to ask the council to uphold the commitments that they made with regards to funding community alternatives to policing uh, back in last year's budget. Um, I'm just going to start with a few facts here. Uh, recognizing that balancing a city budget is a tough thing to do, this budget nevertheless contains a $25 million increase in the police budget, which is already well north of a billion dollars. So I, I think I would hope that any in additional investment in police is an investment in community safety. And any argument that the money is not there to be spent on community safety cannot stand in the face of both the existing size of this budget and also this $25 million increase. Secondly, I will point out that in the wake of a massive public awakening to the gaping holes in our current approach to policing and community safety uh, that was brought upon by obviously like the George Floyd protests, but also just a general awakening to all of the different ways that police, despite potential best intentions, cannot serve the, all the safety needs of communities and especially the needs of communities of color and uh, those who are experiencing mental health crises, the city is behind on the commitments that it made to advance non-police community safety models. Uh, there were four pilots that were approved in February of 2021 and were supposed to have been reported and good to go out on October of 2021 of this year. Right now, they're supposed to be on, they were supposed to be all on the ground by Q1 of 2022. Uh, now there are two that are supposed to go out in March and two that are supposed to go out in June of this year. So there is a significant delay in uh, the going out of these pilots. A lot of what we've heard is that we should be happy that these pilots are going out and that staff are working on them. And we are, but we cannot, us as the citizens of the city cannot settle for crumbs on this front. This is not new funding. This is delayed. These things were announced in the last budget and yet they are only being funded in this budget. This should not be considered new funding. Along with the pilots that we were just mentioned, uh, they approved a decision to an extensive multi-year plan to reassign police services to civilian-led professional services, 
based on existing and successful programs such as the you know, program that exists in Eugene, Oregon, and provide a detailed overview both of the potential for what exists now and uh, a plan to develop these in the future. No such plan has been laid out. There's only been a short-term commitment to these pilots that have yet to be properly funded. At the moment, we don't have a plan for this like further expansion of community safety, and we are three to six months behind on the early part of the plan of getting these pilots on the ground and implemented. We have seen nothing long term. Now, none of this is to critique the city staff currently working on this problem. They are doing great work that is deeply appreciated, both by Reach Our Response Network and everybody who cares about this issue, but they don't have nearly the resources that they need to succeed. We recognize that it is difficult to fully anticipate and fully estimate or precisely estimate exactly how much these kinds of programs will cost because they are new. But that is what innovation looks like. We don't know exactly what it will take, but we do know that it is necessary for this community to be safe and to feel safe, both of which are extremely important. We are not asking you to do this because it's easy. We're asking you to do this because it's important, deeply, deeply important. The quality of lives and the perpetuation of lives are at stake. We would ask that you support your staff in the great work that they've been doing. Give them the resources to succeed, to plan and implement so that we're not having this same conversation in 2023. We cannot be here in 2023 and still be waiting on implementation because plans are nice, but plans don't save lives. Plans don't build communities and plans don't change how communities feel about their safety. We know that you have at least 25 million additional dollars to speak nothing of the over a billion that is being spent on the police to spend on community safety. Please fund what you said that you would fund in the previous budget and please continue planning and expanding community approaches to safety. It is so important for this community and it will be deeply appreciated by your watchful citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Next is Max Moore. Welcome, Max. Can't hear you quite yet, Max. To the chair, this is the host. Max is unmuted and should be able to speak and be heard. Okay, we can't. Unfortunately, we don't. Maybe an issue it on your like, end. It looks like Max just muted themselves. Um, I'm going to uh, attempt to unmute Max one more time. Okay. Max, you are now unmuted. Sort of hear um, I do, yes, I do hear background noise from Max, so it appears that we should be able to hear him. Um, if you'd like to go to the next speaker, we'll attempt to troubleshoot with the deputant. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, wait, to the chair, it sounded like... Max, Hello, Max. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello, committee members, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. This presentation will be a bit different, as most of the presentations you're hearing are asking for more funding from a shrinking pot of city revenue. I want to talk about how to increase city revenues and have a bigger pot to share. This presentation contains a rationale for increasing taxes and the reason why the city tax increase that's now being proposed is a good thing. Uh, I did send a, a written presentation. I don't know if you have that available to you right now. Uh, it contains some graphics. One of the graphics is uh, something, it's a picture of the Canadian economy as a pie that's divided in two pieces. And two equal pieces, if you divide the pie in two pieces, you get what's called a balanced economy. A balanced economy is 50% private spending and 50% public services. Now, a balanced economy is the healthiest form of economy and Canada, fortunately, has the most balanced economy, one of the most balanced economies in the world. But it's not perfectly balanced. Currently, Canada's economy is 45% public spending and 55% private spending. Now, if you follow me so far in this graphic image, that means that there is more room to increase taxes and increasing taxes would be a benefit for Canada if it improves the balance of the economy. 
the goal that we're aiming for is half public services, half private spending. So it helps to increase taxes. That's a rationale for increasing taxes. And uh, the direction the city is going in in raising taxes, I believe, is a good thing. But we can only go so far in terms of raising property taxes. There's, a, there's an upper limit on that. So I'd like to talk about other possible sources of revenue, specifically community income taxes. Now, that's a big subject, and it's not really the purview of this committee today, I know. But I want to, I want to express the idea that community income taxes is a possibility, and it would be a good thing for the city and for the country. And um, that's a long story. I, I worked for the Federal Public Service for 20 years, and I had access to a lot of information that most people don't have access to. And my conclusion at that time is that the federal government is overfunded and municipal governments are underfunded. I did a lot of research on this. And uh, the problem, of course, is income taxes. The federal government claimed it has a monopoly on income taxes. But uh, the provinces uh, challenged that monopoly concept in the 1930s and received, a, quote unquote, their fair share of income taxes. I believe that communities could also get a fair share of income taxes from the federal government simply by um, creating a Supreme Court constitutional challenge. <laughs> that may sound difficult, but the precedent has been set. If the provinces received a fair share of income taxes, there is no reason why municipalities shouldn't receive a fair share of income taxes. Just for the fighting for it, I, I do believe that, that the city could win this battle. Well, thank you very you know, much. A, a court oh. challenge is a, a long-term strategy, and it, it's not something we do in a day. And the city needs the money now, so um, there may be a faster way to encourage the federal government to share its resources a little more readily. And that would be a public relations campaign by the city that pr presumes that the city has the right to receive a share of income taxes. In other words, if we assume we will win the game and mount a public relations campaign in that direction. So uh, to demonstrate what I'm talking about, I have created a website, a demo website called communitycommonwealth.info. If you go to www.communitycommonwealth.info, you can see uh, a lot of background research information on income taxes, so uh, what the weakness is in the federal government's argument that they should have a monopoly, and uh, why municipalities deserve a fair share of income taxes. I, I, would, I don't have the resources to promote this public relations campaign on my own, and I'm wondering if anyone in City Hall might be interested in the concept of community income taxes and how to get them? That's my question. Thank you very much. I appreciate your deputation. Um, we have a question from Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, I, I'm interested. I'm on the record as saying that, that like many US cities, our size and larger, we, we, this is the road we need to go down. Um, if you've been listening over the last couple of days, you know that really almost everything that people are saying we're falling short in our budget are, are things that are to do with wealth redistribution. Are the impacts of poverty, are, are, are the concrete poverty itself, et cetera. And, 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 and so I, I, I've long, I'm on the record as, as being a, a, a proponent of this, uh, regardless of how controversial it is to say so. Um, but you are advocating that rather than keep asking for permission to, to, to collect an income tax or a sales tax, which to my mind would be also very common uh, throughout the rest of North America, other than Canada, um, you're suggesting that we take governments to court for the permission, we, which is to say, stop politely asking and and go to court to uh to to get these powers in your research for for this organization you're building do you know of any uh municipality that took that route and and uh, got a decision 
the municipalities haven't, but the provinces did, and the provinces won that case. The the reasoning of that case was that the municip the provinces never agreed to be excluded from income taxes. If the municipalities put forward that same argument, we never, as municipalities, never agreed to uh, that the federal government should have a monopoly on income taxes. It so just the, 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 the there was no agreement. It just developed that way. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the legal precedent is set by the provinces. The the logic still uh, remains that uh, the municipalities have never agreed to be excluded from income tax revenues. Thank you for that insight. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out today. Next is Brian McLean. Brian McLean. Avico Center. And I uh, wish to speak to you primarily about the climate emergency the city is trying to address. Uh, I'm retired now, but I'm nearly a full-time volunteer with various projects I feel are important. Last year, I helped start the all-volunteer group, the Tobacco Climate Action. Uh, and by the way, I regret that there are no Tobacco councillors on the budget committee or the infrastructure and environment committee to support the kinds of changes needed in Etobicoke and across Toronto. I want to thank Councillor Layton for letting anyone attend his excellent budget town hall that he offers annually. I've actually lived in six different Toronto wards since moving to Toronto as a young man. Uh, moving to Etobicoke about five years ago reminded me of growing up in a suburb of Ottawa as a child and later as a teenager in a suburb of Kingston. In each case, I lived on the edge of natural areas, of farm fields and wooded areas. And now when I return, I see that those natural areas are gone, expanded, transformed into expanded suburbs, and those natural areas that grew food and supported biodiversity are gone forever. I hope the City of Toronto, in its planning, transportation, transit, parks, will work to limit urban sprawl beyond our boundaries by facilitating more people who work in Toronto to live here. Low density areas like Etobicoke and Scarborough need planning initiatives that allow for more gentle density in housing and require shopping and services to be at a walkable distance. If we walk or cycle more, we also keep ourselves healthier while avoiding uh, adding greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere from driving cars everywhere. Transportation is the second biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Toronto. It's imperative that we provide alternatives to, dri to driving passenger vehicles for all our needs. Besides bringing everyday destinations closer to us through changes to the official plan, we need to support TTC services and replacing gas-powered buses with electric buses. And bus service must meet the rush hour demand, so wait times are reduced and, and, TTC, and transit is more attractive to folks. Of course, usage of TTC is down currently because of COVID, but the investments we need to keep making are long-term investments and more transit is an essential component of GHG production. Also, I want to see the city keep supporting what are called nature-based solutions to reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Our parks and ravines, the amazing Meadowway in Scarborough uh, along its hydro corridor, support for food growing gardens and pollinator gardens. These are proactive, positive measures to restore and protect the nature all around us and to absorb more carbon while protecting the biodiversity we depend on. The Medaway for you Etobicoke councillors is an experiment I hope will inspire change in all of our hydro corridors so that they can be, um, th we undervalue them now. Um, they're rather sterile environments for the most part and we can transform them into people places and places that return nature's benefits to our city. So I, I, I would love to see that expanded. I support the ravine strategy, tree plantings that are improving our tree canopy. Uh, and I'm personally volunteering, uh, training right now to be a Toronto nature steward to work with other volunteers in Raymore Park this year. Finally, I learned recently that the city of Edmonton initiated a carbon budget that would be reviewed annually, much as we're doing today with our financial budget. That kind of tool, is valuable for assessing where we are each year, how city spending and our actions contribute to overspending on carbon, and where we can cut our carbon emissions. 
I would love to see a parallel and public focus on our carbon budget every year before we spend, you know, as we spend 12, our $12 billion um, budget, um, we should also be watching how that budget is contributing to or helping ease our climate future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Next three actually are Sheila Pizzi Allen, Lucy Drummond, and Dr. Angela Nardozzi. Sheila, are you up? You are up actually. Hi, Sheila, how are you? Oh, hi. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today and all the attention you're giving to speakers. Um, at, you know, a number of speakers and organizations have spoken today in support of improving transit service and expanding Toronto's TTC discount program. So I wanted to spend these few minutes getting into some of the budget and implementation details of the Fair Pass program. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of TTC Riders, a membership organization of transit users, and we've been following the Fair Pass very closely. We've held sign up clinics, we give workshops, support people how to apply for it. And when we ask people who still don't have access to the fair pass discount, what difference would lower fares make to you? Overwhelmingly, people say lower fares will help me afford food. And the CEO of Daily Bread just spoke to this um, at the beginning of this session. And just to highlight some more of their survey findings, Daily Bread's most recent Who's Hungry report indicated that the high cost of transportation is the second most common reason people report skipping meals only slightly behind the high cost of rent. So thank you so much to councillors Layton and, and, and councillor Carroll for asking some questions last week of SDFA about where the fair pass is at. And I, I wanted to follow up on some of the information that, that came to light. So as many of the speakers have said today, we're very disappointed that in this critical year, when so many people have lost jobs or hours at work, expanding the TTC discount has been delayed for low wage and precarious workers. And we heard last week that the city still needs to set up automatic income verification and work with the Canada Revenue Agency. But what's so frustrating is that this has been the excuse for delaying this final phase of fair pass for years now. I, I wanna say it's two and a half or three years. There was though some positive news that staff said they're estimating a lower cost to rolling out this phase of fair pass. So we're wondering what is that new estimate? Could the final phase be rolled out later this year? And is there also a question of not having sufficient resources for staff to work on that CRA agreement? Importantly, staff also said that there's a consideration for a fourth phase that would deepen the existing discount. And this is so, so important. Let's not make it phase four, let's deepen it now as soon as possible. There's no need to wait on automatic income verification for a deeper discount for people already enrolled. And if you were receiving OW and ODSP, you need every single dollar for food and rent. We can also recognize that the city of Toronto already provides free transit when they give out tokens to people to access programs and on extreme weather alert days. So the need for fully accessible transit is being recognized and some of the cost is being accounted for. It's just in a different line item in the current city budget. So just to um, summarize some of these calls around the fare pass, we think the final phase um, for low wage precarious workers is, is long overdue. This program was first approved in 2016, and we're looking forward to seeing the latest cost estimates and think it should be funded as soon as possible. Second, um, as this last phase gets implemented, the city should be thinking about resourcing sign up clinics, whether that's at food banks or agencies that provide sign up help so that those low wage precarious workers can be reached because we're actually still seeing very low uptake of the current fair pass program. That speaks to the third point that the current discounts need to be much lower. Our low income monthly pass is actually very expensive. It's $123. That's actually more expensive than many regular monthly passes on other Canadian transit systems. And finally, we fully support the change proposed in this budget to expand fare pass to all active OW and ODSP recipients, regardless of whether they're receiving uh, transportation or medical supports. And just a last note um, about fares is that in a few weeks, the TTC board is debating a five year fare plan. And it's a huge opportunity to explore bold changes to attract riders back to the TTC, address poverty and inequality and racism on transit, 
but unfortunately, there are no extra resources budgeted for that planning um, in the Sears City budget or the TTC budget. So any exciting programs that the TTC wants to implement in this critical year to win back riders won't be possible. And so many speakers today have spoken about increasing resources to the TTC for both operating and capital budgets to increase transit ridership to, to meet our climate goals. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. We have a question from Councillor Carroll. So th this, this concept of needing to win back the riders, sometimes when I'm sitting in a TTC meeting, I don't get the sense that, of urgency that we are going to have to win them back. Um, I, I'm wondering if the, the plan is, to, uh, is to, to come there, to come to the commission meeting, because there, there is some potential in the budget that's before us in terms of uh, they've given themselves the staff resources to finish that uh, fair strategy. There, there, there are there are some opportunities that we could use to to do yours that that are in the budget. Not enough, you're right, but uh, some is the plan. Next stop, TTC commission, so that uh, so that you'll be uh, talking to the commissioners there. Absolutely, the TTC is de is debating the fair policy five year fair plan on February the tenth. Yep. Um, but because the city um, is voting on their budget on February seventeenth, it seems like a missed opportunity to um, invest in some of the changes. <coughs> and of course, fair pass is sort of separate from the TTC, which is good. It means other transit users aren't paying for um, these important discounts. Um, and I know that there's been some funding for a ridership reacquisition strategy, but I, I believe, as you said, it's just for staffing. It's not to actually implement service improvements or service increases. Right, right. So it's not a true ridership growth strategy. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next is Lucy Drummond. Lucy? The chair, that speaker is not present. Okay, we'll go on to the next. Dr. Angela Nardozzi. To okay. the chair, that speaker is not present. Okay. Next, we'll try, uh, well, next three are Kristen Vera, Vera Singham, Jessica Ireland, and Carol Essex. So is Kristen with us? Susie Chair, that speaker is present and they are currently unmuted. Okay, welcome, Krista. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? We can hear you great, go ahead. Okay, great. So, hi, my name is Chris from Scarborough Centre, here thanks to Progress <laughs> Toronto. I wanted to start by commending the City for city Council for a few initiatives. First, net zero by 2040. So, we need it sooner with significant investments in transit. Working towards being carbon neutral is critical for vi the viability of the city. I also appreciate the new pilot for mental health crisis teams and hope to see it expanded and appropriately funded along with the city staff who develop and maintain these initiatives. Additionally, it would be great to see the city fall in the footsteps of others like Seattle, which moved 911 functions out of police departments and created a dedicated emergency department to handle calls. Growing up, I was taught the most important number in a emergency is 911, but often that doesn't mean a need for police action, an example being wellness checks. If we want to tackle the mental health crisis, we must look beyond band-aid solutions to crime. Decreasing housing insecurity and poverty are the only proven solution, but why is City Council so reluctant to address these issues as opposed to adding to the bloated police budget? In software development, we have an inside joke. It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's apparent that the hardest workers of the city live the most precarious lives by design. How else do you get nurses and other essential workers of the city, often immigrants like my parents, to work themselves to the bone so individuals and corporations with multiple homes can take over half their paycheck through rent and use it to make the city their playground? It's sad to say that the diversity and multiculturalism Something I used to take pride in Toronto for is just hollow PR. Housing secure insecurity is the whip. Keep those we claim to be our strength toiling so the well-to-do never have to. Let me end with the example of a city that runs without this toxic relationship. 
The only European country in 2019 where homelessness fell was Finland. According to the Guardian article, Helsinki's radical solution to homelessness, the Finnish city almost mostly eliminated homelessness with a pro program of permanent housing. To paraphrase those involved in the pro program, more pilot schemes serve little real purpose. We know what works. You can have all sorts of projects, but if you don't have the supply of social housing, it means little. Helsinki did not become hell with their program. In fact, it still receives top ranks in livability and happiness ratings. Also, because this is a budget committee, the savings per housed individuals was 15,000 euro per person in emergency healthcare, social services, and justice system costs. To conclude, if we want successful mental health crisis teams, they and the city staff need sufficient funding beyond what they receive now, and nonprofit social housing should be the floor for addressing homelessness, not the bar. And I would love to see that achieved through an increase in taxes, whether that's property tax, vacant homes tax, uh, speculation tax, if that's possible. So uh, any tool that can be used, I'd love to see used. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Next, Jessica Ireland. Jessica, you with us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica, and I'm here because of Progress Toronto. I live in Ward 7, Humber River, Black Creek, and I'm here to ask you to redirect funds from the police budget to address the city's ongoing housing crisis. I'm 30 years old. And my mom is 74. She lives on a fixed income and has been on a wait list for rent geared to income for 11 years. As some of you might have experienced, as your parents get older, they start to need you. I want to support my mom any way that I can, but housing eats up such a huge portion of my budget that I'm not really able to. So what should I do? Should I move outside of the city where I can find more affordable housing and be able to help my mom out financially? Or do I stay here where housing eats up more than half of my income so I'm really of no financial help, but I can be close by? Well, it feels like my decisions are being made for me. Most of my friends have already been priced out of the city and it's looking more and more like I will have to leave too. I often wonder who will be left here. All the people that make this city great are leaving because it's just too expensive. Up until two years ago, I was renting a room in a house that was initially a three bedroom house, but it had been renovated by the landlord to house 12 people in a three bedroom house. And this wasn't a corporate landlord, by the way, it was a so-called small landlord. This house was absolutely not fire safe. There was one kitchen shared between the tenants, which was in a constant state of disrepair. The hot water was totally inconsistent because there were just too many people living in one house. When you're living in an overcrowded space like that, you really can't report the overcrowding and the fire hazards because if you report it, you have to move for them to renovate and make the house compliant. And if you could afford to move, then you wouldn't be living there in the first place. I paid $600 a month for that room, which was what I could afford at that time. And that was two years ago. And it's only gone up since then. My experience of housing in Toronto is that of a privileged person in this city. I have a full-time job and I have housing. There are thousands of people in this city who don't. Like many other deputants, I was horrified that the city spent $2 million to violently remove people from encampments and then to learn that none of those people were given housing. To me, that really shows where the city's priorities lie. The only way to ensure that the housing crisis is meaningfully addressed is to seriously and deeply invest in affordable and supportive housing to make sure that everyone who needs a home has one and that they have the supports they need to stay housed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next will be Carol 
Essex. Carol, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Essex, and I'm a resident of Etobicoke Center. And I want to state I'm here of my own volition. I'm not being paid to deliver my deputation. Rather, this is a personal deputation because I am very concerned. But in fact, Chicken Little got it right after all. The sky is indeed falling and taking us down with it. And what I mean by that is greenhouse gas emissions into the sky or atmosphere are rising at an alarming rate, and we are now living through the beginning ripples of climate disasters, with much more to come if we don't get ahead of this soon. I am old enough, perhaps, to miss the worst effects of the climate crisis that we humans have created. So my worry is more for my children and grandchildren, and everybody else's children and grandchildren, and for the preservation of the beautiful bio biodiversity of animals and plants on this amazing planet that we call home. Toronto's answer to the climate crisis is the declaration of the climate emergency and the adoption of Transform TO, and these are both laudable achievements that I fully support. <clears throat> but if Transform TO is going to make a difference in the relentless advance of climate disasters, the vision and mission of Transform TO must be fully funded. This is a huge ask in the face of mounting city indebtedness due to Toronto's massive and effective COVID-19 response and the limitations of our tax base. This city must once again go cap in hand to the province and the federal government to hope to achieve the required balanced budget. But of course, that is how Transform TO must achieve its ambitious goals. The province and the feds must work together with the city as they have throughout, throughout the COVID crisis to fund and implement the urgent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by providing a mandate for all new builds Gold going forward to be zero or net zero emissions, meeting a Canada wide new building code by 2023. Having all existing buildings retrofitted to a national building code standard to zero or net zero on a ramped up schedule, beginning with Toronto city buildings and social housing starting this year. There needs to be fully funded training of youth, unemployed and underemployed and marginalized workers in the new retrofit trade skills and standards and in the new zero emissions national building code, working with the skilled trades, trade unions and colleges to establish certification. There needs to be full funding of increased public transfer transit, sorry, with more electric buses and incentives to bring back ridership and support for equity transit programs such as Fair Pass and Rapid TO. And all infrastructure initiatives and amendments going forward must be viewed through a carbon budget and a climate lens with the greenhouse gas emissions top of mind. This means that protection and accommodation of the needs of cyclists and pedestrians are always part of the budget plan. We are not living in a time of ho-hum where we can carry on with things as usual and get away with it. The sky is falling in the form of atmospheric rivers and record-setting heat domes, causing devastating floods, droughts, crop failures, and livestock death. And this happened in Canada in 2021. We can't imagine that we are living in a sweet spot here in Toronto that will miss the effects of this rising chaos. We must act now in concert with the other levels of government to fully fund and implement the vision of Transform TO. And if you think this is all going to cost too much, 
please consider the much larger costs of letting the climate crisis run rampant. It's time to transform our words into actions while we still have this window of opportunity to make a difference. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on these vitally important matters. Thank you very much, Carol. Next speaker is, the next three actually are Anne Keery, Anthony Rappaport, and Heather Sloman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Anne, go ahead. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Anne Keery. I'm a resident of Ward 11 and a member of For Our Kids Toronto which is part of a nationwide network of parents and adult allies working together for climate justice. I am here today to add my voice to the chorus of voices urging you to fully fund the city's net zero by 2040 climate action plan. When council voted to adopt this plan, Toronto became the third major city in North America after New York and San Francisco to commit to this ambitious but necessary target. And before the vote, our mayor, John Tory, affirmed his support by describing climate change as, quote, the defining issue of our generation. As he put it, we will not see quality of life sustained in this city and elsewhere in the country and the world if we don't take every step possible to address it. I completely agree. And this is why I am disappointed to see that with this budget, the city is not taking every step possible to address the climate crisis, nor the twin crisis of social inequity. We need to be investing in our communities and in social supports rather than increasing funding to the police force. We need major investments in building retrofitting and transport to get our city on track toward its climate targets. And we need new revenue tools. I understand that the city will require funding from other levels of government to fully implement its climate action plan. And I will be doing my best to advocate for that. But the city must also show itself to be committed to its own plan. So today, I wish to urge councillors to support the motion of councillors Wong, Tam and Perks to adopt a sales tax and to reinstate the vehicle registration fee with the amendment in the latter case of charging a higher fee for high emitting vehicles. And then please put those funds toward expanding transit and active transportation. There are numerous reasons for supporting a higher fee for high emitting vehicles. Transportation sector emissions are our second largest source of emissions. 73% of those emissions come from passenger cars and trucks and high emitting SUVs and pickup trucks account for a significant proportion of those emissions. On average, such vehicles produce almost twice as much CO2 per, per kilometer as a regular passenger car. These high emitting vehicles, um, their emissions come with high social costs. They increase air pollution, which impacts our health and that of our children. They endanger cyclists and pedestrians being two to three times more likely than smaller vehicles to kill, especially children in the event of a crash. And this also of course affects Toronto's ability to reach its vision zero pedestrian safety goal. And of course, they negatively impact Toronto's efforts to reach its emission reduction targets. It is only fair and reasonable then that those who choose to drive such vehicles should contribute their part to cover the social costs these vehicles impose. And it is only fair and reasonable that the funds raised should go toward improving public transit and active transportation infrastructure. As numerous studies show, including from the C40 coalition of which Toronto is a member, improved public transit, cycling infrastructure and pedestrian friendly urban design benefits, benefits us all by reducing traffic congestion, improving public health, boosting local economies and improving social inclusiveness. And of course, drastically reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels that are accelerating climate systems breakdown. More specifically then, I urge council to fully fund the TTC Fair Pass program 
reverse TTC service cuts, install more priority bus lanes, and institute free fares for high school students, as the city of Kingston has done with great success. A measure that will, will advance equity, reduce fare policing, which unfairly targets students of color, and encourage all students to become transit riders for life. For our children's sake, we have to get serious about investing in the city and the climate safe future we say we want. And we have to implement the net zero by 2040 climate action plan. Thank you for your time and thank you for your service. Thank you for being with us today. Councillor Carroll, it's a question. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, similar to a question I asked someone else about uh, what your next steps might be in terms of interacting with the city. In enacting some of the priority bus lanes and, and uh, getting ready to provide a, a sort of high performance service in the suburbs, it has been very challenging to get through community consultations where where there's the potential to add those priority bus lanes and i'm wondering if uh, if you're working with an organization that 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 intends as we proceed with that because there is some funding in the ttc budget to proceed with that and then the transit expansion office and the city funds some of the the work to get to get going on those is embedded in this budget but what we're going to need to see are our residents from those areas that are in favor and are from those areas coming forward. Is there, is, are you working with a group that's doing any outreach in that regard or, or planning to, you know, offer to accompany them to attend these consultations, even if it's virtual? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, I primarily organize with For Our Kids Toronto, but I have been in touch with and participated in some of the work of TTC riders. So I will be going back to them and supporting whatever work they're doing um, to move this forward. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next is Anthony Rapoport. Welcome, Anthony. Anthony Rappaport? Yeah. I'm speaking. Go okay. ahead. I'm speaking on behalf of Toronto 350, an all volunteer local activist group focused on climate action, climate justice, and Indigenous rights and sovereignty, loosely affiliated with other 350 groups around the world. First, a climate lens. We'd like to acknowledge the excellent work done by the Environment and Energy Division in applying a climate lens to the 10 year capital plan. The EED takes a whole of government approach and assumes responsibility for Toronto's climate impact as a city, rather than limiting the focus to government itself. We look forward to seeing a similar analysis of the operating budget in future years. However, we believe a true climate lens requires a broader focus. As the financial capital of Canada, Toronto's impact on the climate crisis is felt far beyond our city limits. We need to accept collective responsibility for the significant role of corporations headquartered here. In particular, Council, through its endorsement of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty in July 2021, has committed to work towards these vital goals. End new expansion of oil, gas and coal production and phase out existing oil, gas and coal in a manner that is fair and equitable. We call on the City of Toronto through the EED to initiate in 2022 an annual review of fossil fuel related decisions and investments by Toronto based corporations. Second, nature based solutions. We call for full commitment to the Toronto ravine strategy in the 10 year capital plan identified as an unmet need in the parks, forestry and recreation budget briefing notes. <coughs> Toronto's ravine system is a priceless asset with enormous environmental, cultural and recreational benefits to the city, but is at great risk due to neglect. Third, the TTC. We support the recommendations of the TTC Riders Group, including extend the Fair Pass program to low income workers, a key element of Toronto's poverty reduction strategy currently unfunded, and quickly restore service to pre pandemic levels, a necessary support to essential workers and vital to emissions reductions. Fourth, the police. We do not support the proposed increase to the police budget. For a comprehensive discussion of this issue, we recommend a recent report prepared by the Halifax Board of Police Commissioners Subcommittee to define defunding police. To summarize, the subcommittee recommends that Halifax reconsider police involvement with mental health crisis calls, 
incidents involving unhoused persons, incidents involving young persons, incidents of gender-based and intimate partner violence, overdoses, and noise complaints. Toronto's Community Crisis Support Service pilot project is just a small step in the right direction. To achieve immediate cost savings, we support the recommendations of the Toronto Police Accountability Coalition, with the potential to realize savings in 2022 equal to the pros, pros, proposed increase. And finally, revenue tools. We support the proposal for new revenue tools to be considered at the Executive Committee this week, including vehicle registration and municipal sales taxes. Additional revenue is badly needed to address chronic underfunding of vital programs. It is regrettable that so few of the revenue tools available to cities are meaningfully progressive. Due to Toronto's extreme inequality of wealth and income, most of the resources which could fund the city's needs are locked away in private and corporate hands. We believe a luxury home tax, proposed but not implemented last year, should be reconsidered. We further call on Council to urge the federal and provincial governments to institute a progressive wealth tax and return a portion of it to municipalities. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Next is Heather Sloman. Heather, are you there? Hi. Great. You have maximum five minutes. Go ahead. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Hello, councillors and city staff. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Heather Sloman. I'm a Toronto resident, a member of Progress Toronto, and an occupational therapist who has spent many years working in the community. Today, I'm focusing on housing and housing affordability. I will say at the outset that I'm not speaking as a housing expert. I am simply speaking from the heart as someone who has lived in this city all her life. And as you all represent homeowners and tenants across the city, I can't imagine that each and every one of you isn't aware of the housing crisis, which has taken hold of Toronto. I know that it's good to share personal stories and anecdotes in these deputations, but I don't think I need to share that many in this case, because truly hasn't each and every one of you been confronted with constituents who are facing eviction, who are homeless, or who are moving out of your ward and out of the city because there are no homes even remotely affordable. I'm sure you all have stories. Perhaps like me, you take your dog out for a walk in the morning along a city trail and come across a small collection of tents, as I did, and discover that some enterprising group of people have figured out a way to quietly survive. Of course, given today's temperature, these tents are not a real solution, but I'm sure you know that as well. I'm sure you all have buildings in your ward which are run by negligent and essentially criminal landlords, as I do, where elevators aren't repaired, appliances don't work, or rodent and cockroach infestations are ignored. A few blocks from my house, a building burnt to the ground 10 days ago, a building where fire alarms weren't working and 12 fire infractions were subsequently documented by the city. And I wouldn't be surprised if you have similar incidents in your wards. Tenants complain, but nothing is done, and as they have no other options, they stay. Unfortunately, in this case, 13 households have been rendered homeless. One 20-year-old man is in hospital with fourth-degree burns, and two other tenants are in hospital with second- and third-degree burns. It's pretty horrific, but perhaps you have equally horrific tales. We all know things are bad. We all know things are getting worse. And we all sit with disaster looming as the almost inevitable conclusion. However, while I am sitting here and you are still sitting there, there are some actions you could undertake with respect to the city budget that would have the potential of improving our situation. I believe these are some of those. One, to install a housing commissioner. It would help to have a voice and advocate at the city whose sole responsibility is to ensure that we are striving to increase access to housing equitably. Two, we need to ensure that the Toronto city budget, and I believe this would fall under Rent Safe TO, allocates sufficient resources for city staff to be able to respond to tenants' complaints. I believe that Councillor Layton had in fact moved a motion in budget committee requesting that staff look into um, making this happen so that issues can actually be addressed and resolved by landlords rather than simply um, 
you know, being uh, tracking the response without being able to respond in a meaningful way. Uh, it may be worth revisiting this decision. Three, we need to invest into TCHC repairs. It's not good enough to expect other levels of government to pay for this. We must work to create as many units as possible to help house people. And four, we must continue to fund more supportive housing options and quickly since costs of living and housing costs are continuing to rise. If we do not do these things, we can be guaranteed that our city will continue a downward spiral and we will be faced with a continued unsustainable and overburdened shelter system, which is already in crisis. If we do do these things, at least we are beginning to move in the right direction. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, next three speakers, Gloria Britstone, Audrey Dwyer, and Anna Strange. Stranges. Gloria, are you with us? Are you Gloria. able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to speak. For the last 10 years, I've been a close contact and family friend of a woman named Charlene. She lived at 828 Shaw Street, a low-rise apartment building, which was destroyed by a devastating fire 10 days ago on January 15th. Charlene, along with the other 20 residents, have lost everything and are currently being housed in a hotel. The tenants of 828 Shaw Street are victims of this fire, and I call them victims because I believe this fire could have been prevented. This fire has left them truly devastated, not only physically and emotionally, but all of the residents have been left without any belongings. None of the 13 occupied units carry tenant insurance, and all of the residents were awoken by firefighters with moments to flee as alarms did not go off during this blaze. This building has had 53 complaints since 2018 nine property standard orders and two notices of violations. The building has also received 12 charges and 10 reinspection fees, which were levied because a landlord did not complete required repairs. If the system had worked, could this fire have been prevented? If the fire alarms had gone off like they should have, would people have had enough time to grab their stuff, beloved pets and orient themselves? If the building hadn't failed a fire inspection four days prior to this devastating fire, would someone, still be sitting lying in a hospital bed with serious fourth degree burns? If the fire at 828 Shaw Street eight days prior had been investigated properly and immediate action taken to ensure the safety of this residence, would this building have burned down, injuring three and displacing 20 of Toronto's most underprivileged vulnerable citizens? When I heard of the fire on Saturday morning, I was devastated. I quickly realized government services were not going to be enough and the system wasn't capable of assisting. I joined others in my community and have started two gun GoFundMe campaigns to deal with the fallout of this tragedy. And I keep emphasizing entirely preventable tragedy. Right now, I am working around the clock to find temporary housing and collect basic necessities such as toiletries, clothing, phones, and entire apartment buildings worth of possessions. Let me share with you some of the consequences of this fire. First, let's talk about the injured. Byron, age 20, is currently in hospital with fourth degree burns and due to smoke inhalation, he has suffered a serious trachea injury. Two other tenants have suffered second and three degree burns on their hands and arms, which will take weeks, if not months, to heal properly. The other 17 tenants didn't suffer physical injuries, but every single tenant has suffered in ways you cannot imagine. Financially, they are devastated. Many lost beloved pets, cherished possessions, and keepsakes from their children while others lost necessities such as dentures and eye care. This fire will affect them for a lifetime to come. Now, let me tell you about this building. My own friend Charlene, who was paying 1100 a month, yet her apartment was infested with cockroaches, mice, and rats. When she first moved in, she had no working fridge for the first six weeks. And when she did receive it, it was infested with bugs. Her bathtub would fill with black sludge, so neither she nor her children were able to bathe. I personally called the landlord's office for six weeks straight. Never did I get in touch with anyone willing to assist. Over the course of her tenancy, she has had parts of her ceiling fall down, her sink stopped draining, and the mice and rats got too much for even the traps to handle. These tenants are relying on non-timely, non-enforceable systems to, ass to assist them to live safely within their own homes. With the rising cost of housing and Toronto's out-of-control costs, the lack of rent control, None of these active tenants at 828 Shaw had the ability to move from these horrible conditions, both Coop to Realty and the City of Toronto has left them living in. 
The reason I stress that this fire is preventable is 10 days prior to this fire, a smaller fire took out a whole unit in this building. This fire was contained by emergency services. But on January 11th, four days before this massive fire, the city had in fact opened an investigation on the building. And according to the city website, the building already had 12 violations of the Ontario Fire Code. So what is my ask? I'm asking for an investment into affordable, safe, supportive housing. With the rising cost of living and increased housing costs, this needs to make a priority for low-income Torontonians. I'm asking for a voice and an advocate at the city whose sole responsibility is to ensure that violations put on landlords are being rectified and that non-compliance consequences are being enforced. These tenants have been struggling for a safe, clean home for years. They, like any other member of this city, deserve that. They certainly does not deserve to have their lives go up in flames and they suddenly became dependent on other people's goodwill. So as of right now, I am their support network. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and I appreciate you coming out and being the advocate that you are. Thank you for sharing that with us. Next is Audrey Dwyer. Sorry, Dyer. Pardon me? Oh, Audrey Dwyer. <laughs> Greetings yes. and salutations, all. I'm here today as a member of JFAP, Jane Finch Action Against Poverty, speaking about what we'd like to see from this budget. <sighs> Sorry, that last presentation was a little heavy, and it kind of brings back memories of the 235 Gosford fire that JFAP was helping to support the families who were affected in November of 2019. So I just need a second. <clears throat> All right, so to be clear, with regards to this budget, we unequivocally denounced any increase to the police budget this year, let alone for an additional $24.8 million. Increasing the TPS budget is not only unacceptable, but it is also a reflection of reliance on status quo practices, not a reflection of what the City of Toronto needs to invest in. <clears throat> in the last budget, there was 0% increase to police funding. More of that, please as we work towards their abolition. We would like to see an immediate 50% reduction of the TPS budget so that these funds can be allocated to support and services residents of Toronto actually need. Today, I will speak about our transit wishes as well as what would matter investment-wise for our community and communities like ours instead of more of the thing that this budget suggests. As a collective, in solidarity with many of TTC riders' demands, we too would like to see you fully fund the Fair Pass program for low wage workers, and we'd like to see lower wages or lower fares, not wages, my apologies, <laughs> for all of our workers. This is only possible with the funding from City Council. Take it out of the ballooning and misappropriately provided budget TPS receives. You simply cannot expect the funding to come from ridership during the tail end or fifth wave of a pandemic. Reverse your service cuts to bus routes. Most of these routes were discontinued due to funding issues, not ridership. We implore you to properly fund transit, not negatively impact it. Install more buses for surface routes, such as 35, 41, 36, and 84 series. Not all transit is about trains. Many commuters live in communities not immediately accessible to stations, and it's the surface routes where we need to see some real transit investments made as well. JSAP is a part of a community of workers who were the essential workers and support systems of others during the pandemic. Yet we continue to struggle with adequate bus service. That's reflective of the high demand required of keeping the city moving. Along with stating that we want an immediate 50% reduction, we would like to see an immediate and direct infusion of cash to human care services, such as housing and housing security, create and maintain affordable housing infrastructure and programming, which includes a moratorium on evictions until the end of COVID pandemic pressure cease. Extend repayments to rent bank borrowers with pre-COVID balances until the end of COVID as some of these folks continue to experience financial hardships during these challenging get back to it times. Mental health supports and access, wellness opportunities that are sustainable and accessible, which includes access to green spaces and recreational facilities. Childcare access to and development of more affordable spaces, flexibility with per diem rate or its use, 
considering the rocky on-again, off-again employment environment being experienced by many parents. <clears throat> Excuse me. Food security, local food development and security program, more investment in food growing spaces and effective partnerships, such as some of the amazing programming you saw take place at Black Creek Community Farm during this pandemic. And actually fund and activate the four pilot non-police-led service calls project that you previously voted for. Yes, this budget has indeed included them, which is great as we continue to take steps towards reallocating TPS funding to more appropriate supports and services. We just need action to follow the promises. We consider taking these measures of defunding the police as steps towards wellness for the overly militarized and heavily surveilled communities such as what is experienced in Ward 7. We continue to state that we no longer accept your status quo and or these systems that do not and have never protected us. TPS responds to matters. They do not prevent anything. In fact, police officers have killed and frequently caused serious harm to people, especially Indigenous, Black, and other racialized communities. We need to do things differently. This pandemic has shown how mutual aid has been an effective way of caring for each other yet again. So let's invest in communities instead of entities with a track record of responding to eviscerate instead of care or connect. Ooh, I need my time. There we go. So Perfect. since I need my time, I have actually one point because there was something that came up in the news last night, which was just another example of how individuals in this area are continuously just dealt with the wrong end of the stick. If you saw the news yesterday, um, even when residents own their properties in this community, we still have egregious and damaging situations arise with housing. Yesterday's news, we had one of our residents, um, Daphne Prasad, who JPOP was in contact with regarding her and other situations in their condo at 4645 Jane Street, a building comprised mainly of racialized folks who are seniors, who are workers, a lot of which are now in a financial struggle because their board of directors have mismanaged their money and mismanaged the operation of that building, which is now having some of these seniors leaving retirement to go and look for part-time customer service jobs so they can afford the repairs for their building that their board was supposed to take care of. What happens with condo board oversight and their requirement to have an adequate minimum reserve fund? How did we get Thank here? You. This is just Thank another you. example. Thank you're you. welcome. Thank you. Thank God. Next three, uh, actually the last three speakers are Anna Strange, Donovan Hayden, and Deborah Jules. Is Anna with us? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Anna. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you to the chair and committee for allowing me to speak today. My name is Anna Stranges, and I am representing Margaret's Housing and Community Support Services, and more specifically, Margaret's Toronto East Drop-In Centre. I am a Director of Program and Services, and I am here today to express concerns related to the underlying lack of resources that impact Margaret's and other drop-in services' ability to sustain programming levels and keep our doors open. I'm including other drop-in services as I don't believe that Margaret's experience is unique. Lack of resources coupled with the pandemic has brought to Margaret's attention problematic programming space, continued marginalization of racialized populations and difficulty in staff retention and recruitment. Despite the increase in numbers of service users, the space at Margaret's continue, Margaret's continue to remain the same. Physical distancing requirements has led to capacity adjustments. As a result, many people are unable to access the site for warmth, sleep, or companionship, as well as to use the washroom facilities or obtain harm reduction supplies. The space itself is older and requires significant updates. Drafts, poor ventilation, and old plumbing has not allowed uh, has not allowed for continuous warmth. For example, the drop-in temperature was seven degrees two days ago. And poor plumbing has resulted in shutdown of washrooms for service or limited access to showers and laundry for fear uh, to impacting the fear of impacting taps, 
required for cooking and cleaning in the center. Over the past four years, Margaret's Toronto East Drop-In Center uh, Services has observed an increase and a significant increase in homeless individuals, particularly racialized individuals. Margaret strives to provide a community to these individuals who are often stigmatized by society. Space limitations, limited access to laundry and showers, and long lineups in the cold and blizzard conditions to access a warm place to stay during capacity changes only works to further marginalize individuals and isolate them from the broader societies. As individuals wait to access services, they are often at the ear of the general public who report concerns of COVID transmission and crowding, as well as any other imagined or real concerns the neighbors may have. These individuals present with complex mental, physical, and substance use issues resulting in significant challenges for staff to provide appropriate and continued care. This has been exacerbated by the pandemic, which has been has seen lockdowns in various services and individuals who exhibit ongoing cognitive issues struggling with their use of PPE while on site. Margaret's Toronto East drop-in program has kept its doors open and with extended hours throughout the pandemic and providing support that move beyond the norm of drop-in services, such as providing medical clinics. During this period, staff have been exposed to many unique individuals, thereby increasing the risk of contracting COVID. The increase of client service needs and health and safety risks with limited resources has made it a challenge to retain and recruit staff. Staff burnout and concerns for all overall health has resulted in substantial staff loss. Margaret's as a transfer funded agency has seen a significant amount of our staff pool leave to direct service agencies that provide similar services, which provide better wages and a depth of resources unavailable to the organization, such as benefits and sick leave. Margaret continues, uh, Margaret provides hundreds of thousands of meals to thousands of individuals per year. This is a significant contribution to the overall homeless population and community that exists in the downtown East Toronto. I am concerned should there be no, should there not be an equalization of wages, the essential services such as food security, Margaret's provides will be lost and service participants will be left without urgent and essential supports. I implore for you to consider increasing funding levels for Margaret's housing and community support services, as well as other drop in services in the community, as the work that we all do is essential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll go on to the next speaker, Donovan Hayden. Hi there, uh, I am coming from Ward 11 and here because of Progress Toronto. The committee has heard many strong deputations on reimagining alternatives to police. You have heard facts, figures, policy proposals, and lived experiences. I am thankful for those folks doing that work and want, and want to add a story to that chorus. When I was a child, I was driving with my parents when we came across a police check. You know the stops where police look for unbuckled seat belts, alcohol, or whatever. Now, here's some important context before I continue. My mother is white and my father is black. Everyone still with me? We all good? Okay. Now, I was getting antsy in the back seat. This police check was interrupting my Sesame Street time and I wasn't having it. My mother noticed me squirming, turned around in her seat and said, don't worry, Donovan, police are our friends. After which my father also turned around and said, police ain't no friends of mine. When I tell that story to black people, 
they often laugh or nod in agreement. When I tell it to white people, they tend to react with the same concerned expressions that y'all have right now. The summer of 2020 was that moment on a larger scale. It was an awakening to many white and privileged people about how police operate in this city. I can understand why many people on city council and in this city believe police are their friends, because they are. To my white mother who grew up in High Park, cops were the good guys. However, that is not true for many people. As a black person, I do not interact with cops in that way. The response from many in power is, well then, we just need to make sure police build relationships with racialized and marginalized people. So the police propose an increased budget to fund community resource officers and sensitivity training. The result is just a friendlier way to harass, brutalize, and arrest us. Community resource officers and consultations are intended to lull us into believing you're listening when you really just want to maintain the status quo. Years ago, we believed in these reforms. That same father who told me police ain't no friends of mine decided to give the cops a chance when he was invited to give a training on anti-Black racism to the police. It was clear from the moment he started speaking, they did not care. He was there to check off their diversity box so they could get back to running the city. He finished his presentation, took his honorarium and left, joining me and the other young radicals calling for the defunding of the police. We have been criticized for not understanding the situation by folks like Toronto's mayor. Do I understand the bureaucracy of city council? No. Do I understand the complexity of how a budget is approved? Not quite, but I'm trying to learn. What I do understand is people in my community getting hurt or arrested during wellness checks. What I understand is seeing young black children have guns pulled on them by cops for playing. What I understand is getting stopped by the police because there had been a disturbance in the area over by a man who fit my description. We were all made to understand how cops really operate when they violently evicted unhoused people from the encampments. If all those incidents are due to bad apples, we need a different tree. Police are not my friends. They don't want to be, and I don't want them to be. Because no matter how much they smile or walk around in the community, they are still there to enforce an ideal version of a perfect city that does not include many of us. My mother listened that day to what my father said and started to see the world differently, also joining the fight to defund the police. I hope that you were listening today yesterday and the many years before about the need to defund the Toronto Police Service by 50% and continue slash increase funding in non-police alternatives. Put that money into communities, not cops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donovan. Next is Deborah Jules. Deborah, welcome. Deborah with us. To the chair, this is the host. We've unmuted an attendee we believe is Deborah Jules. Um, Deborah Jules, if you can hear us, please say a few words. Deborah Jules, your line is currently unmuted. If you can say a few words, please. To the chair, I heard momentary background noise, so the mic on their end is definitely picking up audio. Um, they are the last speaker, but they don't appear to be speaking. Okay, so... Deborah, yeah, I heard I heard something in the background too. So, 
Well, uh, I guess we'll have to, uh, if Deborah does want to maybe join this evening's um, deputation, she could probably reach out and do that. Um, but if, I'll give it one last chance. Deborah, do you hear us? Okay, so we'll have to assume that she's not there. Um, I'd like to, uh, again, thank everybody for coming out this afternoon. Uh, appreciate the time we spent together. Um, and all the deputations and